It is traffic chaos for thousands on the drive home this evening after a major crash involving dump trucks closed the westbound lanes of the Gardner Expressway. This is a live look at the second major incident involving a dump truck that has closed live lanes of traffic on GTA highways today. Good evening. The crash happened just after 2 this afternoon. Police say three dump trucks were involved. A man inside one of those trucks was pronounced dead following the crash, and the scene has sealed off the Gardner ever since, sending drivers scrambling for alternate routes. CTV's Beth McDonnell joins us live tonight with the latest on the crash and the chaos it has caused. Beth. This crash, Natalie, Nathan, involved three dump trucks near York Street on the Gardner Expressway westbound. Police say one of those dump trucks caught fire, sending a man in his 50s into medical distress. Paramedics tried to save the man but he did not survive. This crash happened just after 2.15 this afternoon, prompting authorities to shut down the Jarvis ramp and York Street ramp to the Gardner, preventing traffic from going west. The Don Valley Parkway South was also closed at Bayview Bloor. How this crash occurred is still unclear. Police say it's an ongoing investigation. As a result, there's been traffic chaos in the core this afternoon rush hour. I was able to speak with some drivers trying to make their way west on Queen's Key just before 5. It was total gridlock. Some were confused about the slowdown. Others frustrated. Others resigned, saying when there's a tragedy like this, drivers need to be patient. Now, we are getting several updates from police and the city around these roads and what's happening with everything reopening. It appears everything is reopening. Some lanes remain blocked, but we are told that highway routes are moving once again. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Natalie Nathan, back to you. Meanwhile, for many drivers this morning, it was a long, slow track along the QEW. That's because traffic ground to a halt after a dump truck struck a pedestrian bridge that's under construction. It happened on the North Service Road near Cawthra just before 8 this morning. The impact shifted that structure that spans the QEW. Now, traffic on the expressway had to be shut down for more than four and a half hours. A dump truck had the box up and it was coming through North Service Road. And I don't know if he dumped down where they're working on Cawthra or whatever, but the box was obviously not down. So he hit the bridge right where those 2 by 4 or those 2 by 12s are stuck out. Yeah. You see where it's knocked out? And you see here the corner's got a piece holding it up, like this yellow post over here. Yeah. It just knocked the whole bridge sideways. So it's kind of lucky that the thing didn't just drop right down. We were a bit of a cool start to the day, but temperatures did gradually move up, which is nice to see. And that trend's going to continue over the next few days. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Hey, Jess. We're out there getting our day started, but we are doing that slow but steady warm up as we step in towards the middle and the end of the week. A northerly flow to the wind yesterday, northwesterly, was quite breezy, making it feel really chilly outside. Today, we had that northerly wind to get the day going, and then that switch takes place. We have a more southerly flow to the wind. We're looking at high pressure in northern Ontario starting to sink its way down, and we're going to start to notice a difference as we head in towards the day tomorrow. So still a cool evening ahead of us, and even right now, we're still relatively fresh. It is not cold by any means that we are below seasonal still as we kind of make our way throughout the late afternoon, early evening. Temperature-wise, Windsor, London, both at 21. Here in the city, it is still a little fresh and really right across the GTA. We're at 15 through the islands, 16 through Pearson. Tonight, dropping down to 11, we should be at 14. But the good news is if you like the heat, it comes back tomorrow. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including what we can kind of settle into when it comes to this bit of a heat wave that is on the way for now. I'll send things back over to Natalie and Nathan. Okay, thanks, Jazz. Two years after a 28-year-old woman was fatally set on fire aboard a TTC bus, her killer has been found not criminally responsible for her a, death. A judge today ruled that the accused was suffering from an active psychosis incident at the time of the incident, declaring him not guilty of first-degree murder. CTV Sean Lethon has been following this story and joins us live with all the details. Sean. Well, Nathan, Natalie Tenzin Norbu sat quietly while he listened to the judge's decision. He sat quietly while the judge retold the events of that day, how he boarded a bus carrying a jar of lighter fluid and committed an unthinkable act, lighting a complete stranger on fire. It was a moment of horror, 
a woman set on fire while sitting on a bus, dying more than two weeks later. Now, almost two years afterwards, her killer is found not criminally responsible. He feels terrible. The whole situation is terrible, and I want to make that very clear. This is a very sad situation for everybody. Tenzin Norbu was charged with first-degree murder in the death of 28-year-old Naima Dalma after the event took place in June of 2022. In her decision today, Justice Maureen Forstel outlined the details, saying, Mr. Norbu's action on June 17, 2022 were rooted in his long-standing delusions and disorganization. He held a delusional belief at the time of the offense that Ms. Dolma was recording him or had seen video of him. That was grounded in his delusions about the Tibetan community. He had a, a belief against an entire group of people um, that was not founded in anything. Norbu boarded the bus at Kipling Station, sitting behind Ms. Dolma. The decision goes on to say, Mr. Norbu asked Ms. Dolma if she was Tibetan. She replied yes. After her response, Mr. Norbu rummaged through the bag he carried and retrieved a jar of lighter fluid. He intentionally poured lighter fluid onto Ms. Dolma and ignited the lighter fluid. Dolma tried to run away, suffering burns to 60% of her body and an inhalation injury. She died 18 days later. After his arrest, Norbu was assessed by a forensic psychiatrist, with Justice Forstel saying, it is clear from the evidence before me that Mr. Norbu had a disease of the mind, namely schizophrenia, at the time of the offense. The decision noting that Norbu had previously been treated for depression and had not been accurately diagnosed with schizophrenia until after the attack. When asked if they have a message for the victim's family, his lawyer said, I'm very sorry for your loss. I'm very sorry for what happened, but our client was a very sick man. His lawyer saying that their client is getting the help he needs now, and that has allowed him to have some insight into what he did. So he's been transferred to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, where he'll wait a uh, review from the Ontario Review Board. After that, they'll decide where he will be staying, and he'll have annual reviews. And in some time, he could be released. Reporting live, I'm Sean Neethong. Natalie and Nathan, I'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, Sean. Three people were injured. One rushed to hospital after a large fire, make that fight, near Jane and Lawrence late this afternoon. Police say the person rushed to hospital was just 15 years old and suffered stab wounds in the incident. CTV's Janice Golding is live at the scene tonight with the latest. Janice. Hi, Natalie. As you can imagine, area residents are very shaken by what happened here. It happened right after school, so there were quite a few people around who observed what happened. And if you take a look behind us here, you'll actually see an evidence marker on a front lawn with a towel beside it. That is where the teenager collapsed after he was stabbed. Police surround Weston Collegiate Institute, where the melee originated, while more police officers protect a scene on Ellis Avenue, an eight-minute walk away a quiet residential street near Jane and Lawrence where a teen was stabbed. I heard, we heard a lot of screaming, hollering. I looked out the window, I seen about 30 children, like kids running. Uh, and then I saw the young boy, they, he'd come back over and, to my neighbors and that's where he collapsed. So I, I ran out, I screamed, does the young boy need help? And someone said he's been stabbed. So then I young, screamed to my daughter, grab a towel. I ran over and, and the, his friends were putting pressure. I was just holding his hand and just keeping him calm, asking his name. Adele lives a few doors away and says just before 3.30 p.m., she heard screaming and shouting. When she got outside to investigate, she found a 15-year-old boy with a stab wound on his left side. He, uh, he was very coherent. He knew what was going on. He was keeping calm. This surveillance video from a neighbor shows several males running away from the scene. Three, I don't know if they're high school kids, th three males running away from my house. One of them had a bandana over his face. Uh, sure, I mean, it was 10 feet away. <laughs> from me, you know? Yeah. yeah. Does, does it make you a little concerned? Sure, a lot concerned. Not a little, just a lot concerned. Police say one teen was seriously injured while two others sustained superficial wounds in the fight. The teen with the stab wound was transported to hospital by paramedics. A duty inspector is on scene at the moment and we are expecting an update within the hour. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Natalie. At Toronto Police Headquarters, a senior police officer's account of what happened at the scene of a crash involving her nephew has been questioned. Inspector Joyce Scherzer is accused of interfering in an investigation. CTV's Mike Walker reports from the disciplinary hearing. An officer's body camera captures Toronto Police Inspector Joyce Scherzer attending the scene of a single vehicle crash involving her nephew. Accelerated and because of the slick roads he went into the bike okay. stand. 
For the second straight day, the high-ranking officer told the police tribunal she had no role in the investigation after learning what happened from a family member. I did not get involved or insert myself in this investigation. I was there as a family member. I could not let myself become involved, Scherzer repeatedly testified. Scherzer was working at 11 Division when her nephew's vehicle crashed into a light standard near the Boulevard Club on May 1, 2022. Scherzer is accused of arranging for an officer from her division to attend the scene and influencing the investigation. During cross-examination, Prosecutor Scott Hutchison stated, I'm going to suggest to you that what happened here is you got this phone call, you didn't know what you're going into, and you want to control the situation by having it investigated by a friendly 11 Division officer. Incorrect, Scherzer replied. Scherzer has testified that her nephew showed no signs of impairment, but the prosecution alleges the senior officer became actively involved, prevented officers from determining if alcohol was a factor, and influenced the outcome of the investigation. What actually happens is you jump out of the car, tell him what the version is going to be, and he then proceeds to conduct a perfunctory investigation that takes less than a minute, correct? Hutchinson asked. Scherzer replied, incorrect. Officers with traffic services demanded Scherzer's nephew return to the scene approximately three hours later. Scherzer told the tribunal she believes there was no conflict of interest by attending the scene. She was transparent about being a family member, pointed out the damage to her nephew's vehicle, and stood back and had no influence over the officer's investigation. But the prosecution pointed out that Scherzer gave the officer permission to turn off his body camera when conducting his investigation, arguing the constable believed Scherzer was there in her supervisor role. You did not say, you know what, leave it on. It would be a better idea to leave it on. I wish we had, Scherzer replied. The veteran officer has pleaded not guilty to discreditable conduct, insubordination, and neglect of duty charges under the Police Services Act. A paramedic who attended the scene also testified today that Scherzer's nephew showed no signs of impairment. The tribunal is expected to deliver a decision on August 7th. Mike Walker, CTV News, Toronto. Next to the devastation at St. Anne's Anglican Church, the extent of the damage from Sunday's blaze clear from up above. Tonight, the congregation is gathering in a pledge to rebuild, vowing to serve the community once again. CTV's Raheem Ladani is at the scene tonight in Little Portugal and joins us live with the latest. Raheem. Natalie and Nathan, in just over an hour's time, we're expecting this portion of Gladstone Avenue to be filled with parishioners and members of the community as they gather for a prayer vigil. It's been organized by the Reverend of the Church, who earlier today told me that he's been overwhelmed with the outpouring of support. Reverend Don Byers never imagined he'd be crossing police tape to get to the church. But while his place of work has been reduced to ash, his faith hasn't wavered. The church is not just limited to the building. I need to be very clear. The church is much greater than that. And for me, my interest is how do we remain as a church for this community? The church's ties to the neighborhood can still be felt two days after the devastating fire, with people stopping by to see the destruction for themselves. We drove by here every day like to work, so uh, it, it meant something to the people in the neighborhood and, of course, the people of their faith, too. So uh, it's just really sad to, to see that it's all gone. Crews have been brought in to begin the lengthy cleanup process, while investigators spend the day trying to determine the cause, origin and circumstance of the fire. The Office of the Fire Marshal says the timeline of this investigation, like any others that we carry out, is fluid and will take as long as necessary to conclusively determine how the fire was started. For those like Kat, who lives just a few doors down from the church, the vivid blaze is still fresh in her mind. I've watched the whole thing happen. I'd never seen anything like it, uh, especially like the big red flames, like it was shocking. And I, it's definitely devastating. A GoFundMe page has been set up by a member of the church choir who says, along with restoring the building, funds will go to help Father Don arrange interim facilities for services and to support the choir in replacing instruments and music lost in the fire. Directly beside the church still stands Parish Hall, which was unaffected by the fire and where plans are being made to continue to hold service. We're even talking to like, when can we possibly resume our community dinner or when can we resume our regular activities? Uh, my parish is resilient. Strength that in the midst of adversity grows stronger.
The Reverend also told us that since the fire, both the provincial and federal governments have reached out to him to offer their supports. As for this prayer vigil, it gets underway at 7.30 p.m. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan, I'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, Raheem. Auto thefts are down in the city, according to new data. Nearly 4,500 auto thefts have been reported this year, according to Toronto Police Statistics. And that's a decrease of nearly 21 percent from the previous year. Police announced earlier this year that a vehicle was stolen every 40 minutes in Toronto in 2023. The reasons for the drop are not clear. Last month, the federal government unveiled its national strategy to combat auto theft. It includes measures aimed at preventing cars from being shipped abroad and new offenses to the criminal code. It appears a strike that could have slowed traffic at border crossings and airports across Canada has been averted. The union representing more than 9,000 Canadian border workers says it has reached a tentative deal with the federal government. The employees will get details of the agreement on Thursday with a ratification vote expected in the coming days. They have been asking for better pay and retirement benefits, among other things. The Treasury Board says the deal includes wage enhancements and other benefits. The workers were set to begin job action just after midnight on Friday. The head of the Green Party is the first opposition leader. Now, this opposition leader took a look at the documents that came in from the whole issue with the federal MPs and the assumption that perhaps that they were linked to foreign interference. But Elizabeth May says that from what she has seen, there are no traitors sitting in Parliament. CTV's Judy Trin has the details. The top secret version of this. The leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May, got top secret clearance to view the 92-page report and came away relieved. Are there currently MPs sitting with us in the chamber who would set out knowingly to sell out Canada for personal benefit? If there are, there's no evidence of that in the full report. However, red flags were raised with one witching politician. On page 26, an MP who's no longer in office tried to organize a meeting in a foreign country with an intelligence operative. That person should be fully investigated and prosecuted. That person is a former MP. May says there's no list of names in the unredacted version of the National Security Parliamentary Report. The report suggested that a small number of sitting MPs and senators were under the influence of China and India and received money to help their campaigns during the 2019 and 2021 elections. May says these incidents took place during nominations and that there are less than a handful of compromised MPs. This analyst uh, agrees that, that leaders so can take action me. now. She clearly believes that the ethics officers of both the House of Commons and the Senate need to be empowered to have some kind of oversight capacity to kind of be the policeman for the House of Commons and the Senate just to ensure that members understand the rules, understand the threat of foreign interference. May says all the party leaders can come together to find solutions, but to do that, they all have to read the report. Jagmeet Singh of the NDP and the Bloc's Yves-Francois Blanchette says they will get the top secret clearance, but Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says he has no intention of doing so because he doesn't want to be silenced. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, the Deputy Prime Minister was asked today if the party would consider removing any Liberal MPs found to have conspired with foreign governments. Will you kick them out of your caucus, yes or no? As I said... The Minister of Public Safety commented on that extensively yesterday, and he talked about a, a very important next step, which is that just, he, we support expanding Justice Hogue's mandate to review these issues in an appropriate way, in a way that respects national security considerations. The government has said it won't release the names of accused legislators, insisting intelligence reports can contain unverified information. They say it is up to the RCMP to lay charges where appropriate. In Ottawa, a Liberal motion to change the capital gains tax passed in the House of Commons today, despite a no vote by the Conservatives. A job-killing tax on health care, homes, 
farms and small businesses is the last thing we need in this cost of living crisis the Prime Minister has caused. He wants to tax doctors away when we have a doctor shortage. He wants to tax farmers when we have a food price crisis. He wants to tax home builders when we don't have enough homes. He wants to tax small business when our, all, our economy is already falling off the cliff and having the worst growth in the G7. Conservatives have now decided that they will not be voting in favour of fairness for Canadians. They will, in fact, today be voting against the Ways and Means motion to set fairness for everybody. The change will take effect June 25th. It's intended to require Canadians who make a profit from selling assets pay more capital gains tax. The Liberals say it makes them pay their fair share. The Tories insist increasing the inclusion rate will not hurt billionaires. Instead, it'll prompt them to sell their assets and move their businesses elsewhere. If elected, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says he would simplify tax rules, cut taxes, and address favorable treatment of corporations. Now, there are conflicting reports about the fate of a ceasefire proposal outlined by U.S. President Joe Biden last week. A senior Hamas official who is based outside Gaza says the group accepts a U.N. resolution adopted yesterday that backs a plan to end the war. And Hamas says it's ready to negotiate details. As well, Qatari and Egyptian mediators say they've received a formal reply from the group to the ceasefire proposal introduced by Biden. Hamas expressed a readiness to positively reach a deal, but Israel's now saying it received a Hamas response through mediators and the plan has been rejected. Israel says Hamas has changed all of the main parameters. The U.N. Human Rights Office says both Israeli forces and Palestinian armed groups may have committed war crimes in a deadly raid Saturday in Gaza. The raid by Israeli forces on a refugee camp in the Nursirat area freed four hostages taken by Hamas in October. Officials in Gaza say at least 274 Palestinians were killed in the raid. The United Nations says the killing of civilians by Israel may amount to a war crime, as could the holding of captives in densely populated areas by Palestinian armed groups. Israel said it carried out intensive strikes when a firefight erupted as the rescuers withdrew. Ukraine's president has begun a week of intense diplomacy that took him to Germany today. <laughs> Volodymyr Zelensky thanked Germany for its support in his speech to lawmakers in Berlin. Earlier, he addressed a conference on Ukraine's post-war recovery. Zelensky appealed for short-term help in repairing his country's electricity network and long-term investment in its energy system. He will also attend the upcoming G7 summit in Italy and a global peace summit in Switzerland. Hunter Biden was convicted today of lying about his drug use to illegally buy a gun. A jury in Delaware found Biden guilty on all three counts against him. Prosecution witnesses testified about his addiction in the weeks before and after the gun was bought in October 2018. Lawyers for the U.S. president's son sought to show he was not using drugs when he purchased the weapon and did not intend to deceive because he didn't consider himself a drug user when he filled out the form. No sentencing date has been set. An update on the construction of the Gordie Howe International Bridge. The two sections of the span are now just 11 meters apart. These images show crews installing temporary bracing that will hold the two segments in alignment. The Canadian and U.S. sides are expected to meet over the Detroit River by the end of June. And that's when crews will install the final segment known as the mid-span closure. The two and a half kilometer bridge will link U.S. Interstate 75 with Highway 401. Construction began in December of 2022. Paying for a paving job and finding out you didn't get the company you thought you hired. What happened to some Brampton residents and why their attempt to rectify the situation ended up with one of them in handcuffs. That story ahead. And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert. It's an appliance many of us have in our homes, a front loading washing machine. A family was shocked when the door and their washer shattered without warning, sending glass shards everywhere. We check it out. I love that story just ahead. And it has been noticeably cooler over the last two days, but that all changes as we head in towards the midpoint of our week. The hot spot today in northern Ontario. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast as we get to seasonal and then well above heading in towards next week. And stay with us, we've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Many people have switched to front-load washing machines from top-loaders because some feel they clean better 
and are gentler on your clothes. While front load washers are considered safe, occasionally they can have issues with their doors, which contain glass. Here is Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Natalie and Nathan, a man was about to do a load of laundry when the glass door on his washing machine shattered. Glass went flying everywhere, and while the company agreed to replace the door, the family has concerns it could happen again. Um, these are actually the clothes that we were going to do um, on the morning of the glass explosion. Lacey Hepworth of Etobicoke says it was two weeks ago when her husband was about to do a load of laundry when the glass in the door of their washing machine shattered. So here's the blood from my husband hurting himself and the glass absolutely exploding on my husband. Hepworth says she was upstairs when it happened. I was sleeping and the... Uh, explosion of the glass was so loud it woke me up. I thought it was a car accident outside. Hepworth has two small children and two dogs and says it could have been much worse. It wasn't just large pieces. It was very small shards of glass, very sharp pieces of glass. Um, it was shocking. The washing machine is a Samsung. It's uncommon for a glass door to shatter on a front loader, but it does happen. We did a story with Nora Schrammick of Toronto two and a half years ago when the door shattered on her Electrolux washing machine. The glass in the laundry completely shattered. In Hepworth's case, Samsung agreed to replace the glass in the door on her washer, but she says that's something she's not comfortable with. I'm seeing shards of glass inside the machine. I have two young kids. I don't want to be scared to wash their clothes. When CTV News reached out to Samsung, a spokesperson told us, customer satisfaction is a top priority for Samsung Canada. We are aware of this matter and are working with the customer on an amicable resolution. In the end, Samsung agreed to give Hepworth a brand new washing machine, which was great news for her. Thank you so much, CTV. Um, you guys definitely saved the day for me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you a million times over. I am so happy that I contacted you guys. And it's not clear why the glass would break in a washing machine, but there are concerns if you leave coins, belts, or other hard objects in a washer, they could cause nicks and scratches that could weaken the door over time. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. To a CTV News investigation now into a paving company making a name for itself by pretending to be someone else so that the trail angry customers follow lead back to another company that has no idea what is going on. Now, CTV John Woodward reports their impersonation was so effective it may have even tricked police. They just uh, destroy your driveway. John Shu might have said yes to a new driveway, but he says a paving company never gave him the chance. And on May 14th, workers ripped his driveway up without his permission. No document, no any signatures, and, and nothing. The business card said Royal Town Construction, and Shu, a 62-year-old engineer, called them to complain. He wasn't the only one, except Royal Town Construction supervisor Costa Alexopoulos had no idea what they were talking about. We're not there. You know, we were in Brampton doing a parking lot. We're not even anywhere near where you guys are. And then it clicked in. His business card, similar but not identical to the ones the other company had left behind. Alexopoulos rushed down. Let me see the asphalt tickets. He took this video. It shows the workers silently scattering. They left machines, equipment behind and just took off. One of those machines left behind this roller. Shu called Peel Regional Police and says officers told him they started a fraud investigation because other neighbors had been hit too. More than 10 um, victims from, the, from this case. But a few days later, different officers returned, Shu said, asking about that roller. They can be seen on a neighbor's surveillance camera. Shu said he wanted to hold on to it as collateral for his driveway. Those two police didn't know anything about this uh, fraud case. The next time the officers returned, they weren't asking. Shu was arrested. The video shows him being put into a police car as his wife tries to figure out what is happening. And while Shu is spending six hours in jail, the video shows the police standing by as the owner of that roller loads it up on a flatbed truck. In my 62 years history, I didn't have anything like this. I feel that I was badly treated by police. Peel police say they're looking into what happened and don't have all the answers yet. But they did confirm that the complainant in the case that resulted in the arrest of Jun Shu was a paving company.
Alexopoulos said he never called police about that roller. He says his company uses much larger machines. He says he still gets multiple calls from customers complaining about another company using his name. They're smart. They're going to use one of the best names to, to get the work because they know it's going to be easy to get it. Are these guys so good that somehow they've even scammed the police? Well, when the police was there and the one pickup and trailer they left on site, the police ran the plate and told us it's coming back as unknown. Alexopoulos wants customers to be wary and if anyone shows up claiming to be Royal Town Construction to call their office before agreeing to anything. As for Shu, he's planning to get his driveway fixed, this time by the real Royal Town Construction. John Woodward, CTV News. Well, to the forecast, it was a cool start to the day, but things have kind of improved. And if you have maybe the kids got football or baseball or soccer tonight, weather's not too bad. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as we move into the middle of June, we're feeling a little bit more like <laughs> we're getting into the swing of summer, fewer highs and lows. You know, we started off the month, those first few days, so hot outside. We had those humidex values that were really high. Then we cooled right down, but we are still technically into the spring season, right? We're, we're stepping into summer, uh, sorry, the fall, yeah, spring season. We're stepping into the summer season on the 20th, and we will start to see things shift as we head in towards the end of this week in a really beautiful way. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand, it's hard to stop a train. Now, temperature-wise, notice it'll be cooler again today. We didn't quite get to that seasonal mark, but sitting at 16 right now here in the city, 21 down towards Windsor, but the hot spot still remains in northern Ontario at Piawanic. They're looking at 23. Heading into this evening, we'll sit at 11. We should be at 14, so we're not quite there, but We'll get there and then some in the days to come. So if you like the cooler nights, enjoy it because it isn't going to last for too much longer. Right across the board, we're holding on between 2 and about 5 degrees below the seasonal average. Into the day tomorrow, we'll sit at 24 and then we get a humid X back. So it'll start to feel like 27. So a very seasonal day ahead of us. As we head in towards the afternoon tomorrow, we see the cloud cover clear out and that area of high pressure sitting in northern Ontario will push its way down, continuing to clear out that cloud cover, making for a beautiful kind of second half to our day. Temperature wise, things will start to improve as well. We get back to a seasonal mark as we head through the rest of our evening. Again, just a few light clouds out there that continues overnight, a mix of sun and cloud to kick off our Wednesday. And then as we head into the midpoint of our day early afternoon, that high pressure really settles in and we get warm and we get very sunny into the afternoon. As we head in towards our Thursday, we start off with a lot of sunshine out there, but then we're watching a low pressure system push its way in, set to bring some rain later in the day. So the chance of showers lingers into the afternoon, but really the heavier shower activity is kind of into that early evening just after 7 p.m. It clears out pretty quickly, and as we step in towards the weekend, it is going to be quite beautiful outside. Temperature-wise tomorrow, again, we are finally back towards a more seasonal point. We have a southerly wind that will kind of help to increase that daytime heating as we step into the afternoon. It does stay quite warm into the evening. We'll sit at 17. We should be at 14. So we were experiencing those cooler nights, but that changes pretty dramatically as we head into the next couple of days. We stay warm on Thursday as well. Those showers likely into the evening at their heaviest point, but the chance does linger from the afternoon onwards. It clears out, though. As we head into Friday, we get up to 25, 14 for the low, so probably the more seasonal day. And then stepping in towards the weekend it is going to be beautiful high pressure rolls in clears out the sky for your dad the, the father figure in your life which is for celebrating anybody and anything a beautiful weekend and that continues into next week as we climb into the 30s and that's before you factor in the humidex lots of heat hopefully everyone's prepared accordingly i'll send things back to you guys all right thank you jess coming up on ctv news quashing the habit before it even starts a new pilot project looks to steer youth away from vaping by educating their teachers The Lung Health Foundation and Ontario's Ministry of Education have teamed up to tackle the growing problem of vaping in teens. And as our health reporter Pauline Chan tells us, Canada has the highest rate of youth vaping in the world. We focus primarily with youth so that they can avoid the debilitating impacts of chronic lung conditions in the future. Quash is a pilot project with webinars to educate teachers across Ontario about vaping and how to help kids avoid the habit. We know that over 750,000 kids in Canada vape on a daily basis. Uh, a number of them are addicted because of the, the high um, addictive properties of nicotine. A lot of youth are doing it, you know, to manage stress, to manage anxiety, but also, you know, they might be doing it because of social pressure. 
So far, they've had two webinars for teachers and one for parents. And there are many misconceptions about vaping. For children that have never smoked, vaping is not harm reduction. Vaping is not smoking air or water. It's inhaling over 2,000 substances, many of, of which are toxic, into young lungs, developing bodies, developing brains. We've had kids verbalize to us, like they notice, um, you know, that they can't run as much in gym and they can't participate as, as what, how they used to. Principal Heather Hickey of Almaguen Highland Secondary says they've noticed more kids vaping and at younger ages. A recent survey shows certain kids are more vulnerable to vaping, like those in northern communities. Um, youth who are in, you know, the 2S LGBTQ plus community and Indigenous youth are more likely to vape than heterosexual youth um, and white youth. And so far, they've had 120 Ontario schools represented in the webinars, with more planned for the fall. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The Competition Bureau has obtained a pair of court orders as part of its probe into potential anti-competitive conduct in the grocery sector. The court orders require the parent companies of Loblaws and Sobeys to hand over records about real estate holdings, lease agreements and other customer data. The Bureau says the information will help determine whether the grocery giants are imposing restrictions that negatively affect competition. The watchdog is investigating the use of property controls in the industry. It says there is no conclusion of wrongdoing at this time. Kia is recalling more than 20,000 SUVs in Canada over a fire risk. 2020 to 2024 Telluride models are being recalled because of a faulty front seat adjustment knob. Out of an abundance of caution, Kia Canada recommends vehicle owners park their vehicle outdoors and away from other vehicles or structures until the recall repair has been re performed. Owners will be notified by mail starting at the end of July with instructions to bring their vehicles to a Kia dealer. It came from above, and now folks living in Ituna, Saskatchewan, are buzzing because Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, sent a crew into a field to repossess the space junk. The discovery was made by a farmer and his neighbors. CTV's Allison Bamford was there for the pickup. Two employees went farm to farm, retrieving the space junk. Some pieces weighing 100 pounds, others standing three meters high loading them into a U-Haul to take back to their offices. I'm afraid we're not able to, uh, to make any other comments. SpaceX has yet to respond to our requests for comment, but we do know these are just a handful of at least eight pieces found across five farms. Astronomers say the pieces fell to Earth back in late February, believed to be parts of a trunk from a SpaceX rocket. Those pieces are huge, right? What if it had fallen on Regina? What if it had fallen on Barry Sawchuk's house, right? Like it absolutely would have killed people. Barry Sawchuk found the first piece in April and never thought it would lead to this. It's community, right? It's, it's our little community and getting together with everybody and for once in a lifetime thing. Sawchuk didn't say exactly what he discussed with SpaceX, but told reporters the company is trying to figure out why these pieces didn't burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. The farmer is also receiving compensation, money he plans to donate to the new community rink. Allison Bamford, CTV News. Safeguarding your health. It's Wellness Wednesday, and we'll turn the microscope on meningitis with Dr. Alan Grill. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. Updating our top stories, one man is dead after a major collision on the Gardner involving multiple dump trucks. Police say three trucks collided just after two this afternoon in the westbound lanes of the Gardner near Spadina. One of the trucks caught fire and a man in his 50s was pronounced dead at the scene. The Gardner was closed for several hours, but all lanes except one have now reopened. I, we heard a lot of screaming, hollering. I looked out the window, I seen about 30 children, like kids running. And then I saw the young boy, they, he'd come back over to my neighbors and that's where he collapsed. So I, I ran out, I screamed, does the young boy need help? And someone said he's been stabbed. So then I young, screamed to my daughter, grab a towel. I ran over and, and the, his friends were putting pressure. I was just holding his hand and just keeping him calm, asking his name. A 15-year-old boy was rushed to hospital after a late afternoon stabbing near Jane and Lawrence. Police say there was a large fight in the area. Two other people suffered minor injuries. Police say the teen who was stabbed suffered serious injuries. It feels terrible. 
the whole situation is terrible, and I want to make that very clear. This is a very sad situation for everybody. And a judge has determined the man who killed a woman on a TTC bus by setting her on fire was not criminally responsible for her actions due to longstanding delusions. 28-year-old Naima Dolma died days after being attacked by Tenzin Norbu in June of 2022. Norbu will now be in the care of mental health professionals. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. National Bank of Canada plans to buy Canadian Western Bank in a deal that would further consolidate the Canadian banking industry. Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Montreal-based National Bank of Canada is buying Edmonton-based Canadian Western Bank for about $5 billion. National will issue shares for the lender, valuing the acquisition price at just over $52 for each share of Canadian Western, a massive premium of 110% over today's closing price. The deal requires the approval of two-thirds of Canadian Western shareholders and the federal government. National also announced a $1 billion sale of new shares. The takeover follows Royal Bank's purchase of HSBC Canada for more than $13 billion. On the markets, the Canadian dollar changed hands at 72.71 US cents, up a fraction. WTI oil was at $77.55 US a barrel, up 22 cents. Western Canadian Select Oil traded at $64.32, up $2.18. And the TSX Composite ended at 21,887.34, down just over 182 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. The Edmonton Oilers are now down two games to none in the Stanley Cup Finals. Rodriguez now tried to center. That was blocked by Brown. It comes back to Rodriguez, and he scores! The game was tied 1-1 going into the third period. Evan Rodriguez scored twice in nine minutes to give Florida the lead. The Panthers would add an empty netter for the 4-1 win. The Oilers had just 19 shots on goal in the game. Only five teams in NHL history have overcome a 2-0 deficit to win the Stanley Cup. Game three is Thursday night in Edmonton. It's another opportunity for our group to uh, come together um, and dig our way out. Um, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. Um, and I'm excited to see what our group's made of. I'm excited to see um, our group come together. I'm excited to see um, us fight through adversity. And <clears throat> looking forward to people doubting us again. You know, we're. Uh, you know, we're, we're good with the backs against the wall. Conor McDavid is an icon of Newmarket and all of Canada, of course. So, you know, Newmarket feels very, very proud, very strong about Conor McDavid. And, uh, of course, we want to cheer on a Canadian team in the playoffs as well. We want to support Conor McDavid, Newmarket boy. So that's why we're here. And we love our hometown and we love living in Newmarket and we love being with the community. Chilly temperatures couldn't keep proud Newmarket residents from cheering on their hometown hero, playing on hockey's biggest stage. Dozens turned out to watch the game at Riverwalk Commons, which was temporarily transformed into Connor McDavid Square. After a successful first season, last night was draft night for the Professional Women's Hockey League, and a Georgetown player was picked first. New York selects Sarah Fillier. Georgetown's Sarah Fillier brings an impressive resume to New York. The 24-year-old has an Olympic gold medal and three world championships, not to mention a degree in psychiatry from Princeton University. Natalie Spooner has been named MVP of the PWHL's inaugural season. The Toronto forward led the league in goals with 20 and added seven assists, helping her team finish first overall in the standings. Coming up on CTV News, a new star will soon be shining down upon us thanks to a once-in-a-lifetime celestial explosion. The Out of This World story coming up.
Finally tonight, astronomers are preparing for a celestial event years in the making. And it could happen anytime between now and September. An explosion is set to occur in the Milky Way's Corona Borealis, which occurs every 80 years or so. And once the nova peaks in brightness, it'll be as if a new star has appeared. One that should be visible for a few days without any equipment and a little over a week with binoculars. It will then dim and disappear from sight for another eight days decades. That is fascinating. A star is born. It's out of Very this nice. world. <laughs> you were I waiting for that. I was. I was like, I hope no one else says that joke. <laughs> Add that to your forecast. <laughs> Listen, the forecast is also out of this world. It's to the moon and back. It's going to be so nice as we head in towards the end of the week. But with all that heat and humidity comes the perfect recipe for pop-up showers. So it comes... Heat. As we step in towards the midpoint of our week, it gets back to seasonal and then above seasonal. And then by the beginning of next week, we're well into the 30s. So we ricochet uh, in the opposite direction of what we're doing right now. High pressure holding firm, so we'll keep that shower activity at bay for now. It will sink its way a little bit further south as we head into the day tomorrow, clearing things out heading into the afternoon. But for now, it is still relatively fresh out there, just 16 degrees, 21 through Windsor. As we step into the next seven days, we start to see that slow but steady climb. By the day tomorrow, we're at 24. By Thursday, we have some late day showers, but overall it is looking beautiful just in time for Father's Day. And a reminder about the new Lotto 649 with two big jackpots, two be one on one ticket. Wednesday's classic jackpot is $5 million. And the new gold ball jackpot is $64 million. You can head to olg.ca for more information. Thank you, Jess. And be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CTV24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.